loves everybody today. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for praying for our nation. We need it. And uh, appreciate all the prayers that you can send in our direction. Brian, that was very kind of you to take the time to do that. I thought that, that touched mine and Dave's heart. Amen. Well, I know that you got a lot to do here today, and I'm going to get right into the Word. Let me just tell you first that I write books all the time, and the last book, well, it's not the last book I wrote, but the last one that came out is called Do Yourself a Favor and Forgive. Do yourself a favor and forgive. And I'm going to ask all of you to seriously consider getting a copy of this book and reading it, and if you have even one angry friend, get a copy of it and give it to them. And this is the kind of book that every time somebody hurts your feelings, every time somebody offends you or wounds you, you can get in here and open up to pretty much any chapter, and the word that's in it will help you get over it. Can anybody say amen? Now, Watchman Nee said that Unforgiveness in the heart of believers is the single biggest open door for the devil. And I believe that. I've been teaching God's Word for, I don't know, close to 35 years. And uh, I can tell you from my experience, from my travels, from being in many different churches, my own conferences that there are a lot of angry people in the church. Not just outside the church, but in the church. Sometimes people have been angry so long they don't even know that they're angry anymore. It's just something that kind of settles down into the bottom of their life somewhere and leaves a little bit of a hardness on their heart and a little bit of bitter taste in their mouth, but boy does it ever affect us in devastating ways that we may not even understand. For one thing, it affects the anointing on our lives. And I want to talk to you just a little bit this morning, a little bit later, about the anointing of the Holy Spirit, because I don't hear that talked about as much as I used to. And I think we need to stir up the remembrance of how precious the Holy Spirit is in our life, and how we want to make sure that there's a, a flow for Him, that there's no hindrances or no blockages for Him to flow through us. We work very hard and have all the years that we've had our ministry to keep all the, the strife that we can out of our ministry. Now we can't always do anything about the way somebody else decides to feel, but any time that we know that there's strife or offense or any kind of ripples between people or people toward us, we will take the aggressive role and try to make that thing right, make it well. I'd like to start in Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 18. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If possible, as far as it depends on you, you can't do anything about the other person. If they don't want to be peaceful, there's nothing you can do about it. But as far as it depends on you, you live at peace with every person. Now, there's a scripture that I want to use this morning, and then I'll be using it some again Thursday evening. One that I think we tend to avoid a little bit, and it's, it's, it's in Romans 12, and it says that every man, every man will stand before God and give an account of himself to God. Now this has really helped me to understand that I'm only responsible for how I behave. If somebody wants to have a problem with me and I've done everything that I can do to try to make it right and they still don't want to make it right, then I really can't do anything about that. If I've really done something to them, I can apologize. 
I can pray for them, but I, I can't make people like me. I can't make people be at peace with me. I can't make people not talk unkindly about me. I can only do my part. And you know what? That's the only part that God is going to hold me accountable for when I stand before Him. Let me say something to you, and be sure you grab this and maybe even write it down. You make sure that you do what's right before God, whether anybody else you know is doing it or not. Did you hear me? If everybody else you know wants to do the wrong thing, you still do the right thing, because you're only going to give an account of yourself. And that's not anything scary. Every man will stand before God and give an account of himself. We know that we're saved by the grace and the mercy and the blood of Jesus Christ, and that's an established fact. But it is important how we live, because God didn't save us just so we could have a nice fluffy feeling and be saved. He saved us because He wants to do something with us. He wants to use us to help the rest of the planet. We don't belong to ourselves. We've been bought with a price. We're here for a purpose. And we need to realize that every single day of our lives. If God just wanted me to be saved and nothing else, then when I got saved, He'd just beam me up and that would be the end of it. But since He left me here, He's got a purpose for me. And the Bible says that we are to be salt and light in a dark and a tasteless world. One of the things that has brought such an unkind reputation to the church of God is the fact that we have such a hard time getting along with each other. Denominations not getting along, people not getting along. I mean, I've been parts of many churches, and I can tell you that in many of them, not all of them, thank God, but in many of them, even though people march off to church every Sunday, still behind the scenes, there's this ripple of strife. I well remember when I went to the church that I was in many, many years ago before I learned anything about the Word. I mean, I, I was involved. I was on the church board. My husband was an elder. Our kids went to school there. I mean, we were up to here in church. And we would go to church on Sunday, go out with other couples after church to breakfast, and sit there and gossip about the pastor, and this, and that, and this, and that, and something else. And I'm thankful that I've grown beyond that. Where there's unity, there's anointing, and where there's unity, there's blessing according to Psalm 133. Where there's unity, you've got to have unity in your family as far as you're concerned. Make sure that as far as you're concerned, you're not part of any strife on your job, in your neighborhood, at your school, and especially not in the church or in your ministry. We want to make sure that we protect that anointing, because to be honest, no matter how many methods and how many programs and how many bright ideas we have, no matter how polished our presentation is, there's only one thing that's going to make anybody successful in ministry, and that is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Nothing else. I don't do a lot of fancy stuff. I talk. That's it. You would not have wanted to have heard me sing the Star Spangled Banner. Whatever key I sing in, they don't know what it is, so anytime I try to sing, the microphone gets turned off. <laughs> I don't have a lot of professional education. I've got some doctorates that I've been given and one earned doctorate that I've gotten from all the books that I've written, but I went to the 12th grade. When God called me to do this, I did not have any idea what I was doing. And when I look around at what we've got up and running around the world, I just go, how in the world are we doing this? I don't know how we're doing it. I mean, I couldn't possibly tell you how we're doing it. Well, I do know it's because of the anointing. There's nothing more precious to us than the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that it teaches you, it equips you, it empowers you. I don't always feel anointed when I get up in the morning, especially when I've been out on the road traveling and you're preaching for the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth time, still got jet lag. But I have never one time in my whole ministry ever stepped into this role that God's called me to and not sense God's anointing to enable me. 
I don't always feel it the same all the time, but God always comes through. So let's always remember that whether you're a stay-at-home mom or whether you're pastoring a, a church or got a worldwide ministry or you're a mechanic or a painter or whatever you are, everything that we can do is a gift from God, and it comes through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And let's also remember that we don't have to be naturally equipped to do something. If God decides He wants you to do something, the anointing of the Holy Spirit overrides all deficiencies. Did you hear me? You really don't know how much in the natural I should not be doing this. But I know. People say, well, they, they want to know your three keys to success. I couldn't tell you if I had to. Love God, do your best to do what He tells you to. Keep putting one foot in front of the other one. Don't quit. Don't give up. Amen? Protect the anointing on your life. Now, when we started our ministry, God very definitely spoke to my heart and said, keep the strife out of your life and out of your ministry. And that was very important for me because I was a fairly strifeful person. I was angry more than I was not angry. And it wasn't always an explosive outward anger, but there was always something going on inside me that I didn't like about somebody or something. And so it was very important for me to realize that I could not minister except from a foundation of peace. You might remember when Jesus sent the disciples out two by two to go and minister, He told them, go find a house and say, peace be unto you, and if your peace abides there, you can stay there. If not, then you need to shake the dust off and go on somewhere else. Well, what I get out of that is that if Jesus is sending me out to minister, then I have to do it from a foundation of peace in my life. Come on. Got to have that foundation of peace in my life. I remember when Dave and I would argue all the way to church, if the devil can stir up anything, it'll be on Sunday morning. We'd argue all the way to church. and. Boy, as soon as we saw that first person that we wanted to impress, it was praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, glory to God, stand in church with my hands lifted up, singing the songs on the overhead, thinking if he thinks I'm going to cook him anything to eat today, he's got another thing coming. (laughs) Get in the car and argue all the way home. I am so glad that those days are over in my life. I am so glad that those days are over. I am so glad that those days are over in my life. And I can tell you, I didn't just go get somebody to pray for me that I would be peaceful. I had to pursue it and seek it. I had to crave it. I had to desire it. I had to get willing to live beyond my feelings. Because you know what I found out? If somebody hurts me, even though I may feel like smacking them in the head, God will empower me to pray for them, to bless them, to give to them, to talk to them, and to take a chance on letting them back into my life, knowing full well that they may hurt me again. Come on, give God praise. I really intended to teach something else today, but I really feel like that God wanted me to teach this. I'm going to be very honest with you. No matter how many times you've heard this message, it's one of the most necessary messages for the body of Christ, because we are powerless if we're divided. If we want to have revival, and we want to impact the world, and we need to want that because the world is in an unbelievable mess, and getting messier every day. And I believe that God's on the throne, and I believe He's going to do something, and I believe He's looking for people to do it through, but I'm telling you, it can't be a bunch of people that are in strife, bitter, offended, resentful. It's got to be people who keep a foundation of peace in their life. Where there's no peace, there's no power. Don't fight at home all the time and then just march off to church every Sunday and go back home and fight. Don't go to church every Sunday and then go to work and sit and gossip at the lunch table all the time and then go back to church the next week. Don't be part of that. Make a decision today that you are not going to be mad at anybody. Do yourself a favor and forgive. When God tells us to forgive people, the reason why I named that book that was I was hoping 
you know, usually if you can get people to think there's a benefit, then they'll buy the book. <laughs> if there's no benefit, they don't buy the book. Like, it would be useless for me to write a book on pride or obedience. I mean, I even wrote one on love, and that didn't do too great. <laughs> Seriously, I wrote a book called The Love Revolution, and we've sold less of that book than any book I've ever written. You know why? Because it was all about forgetting about yourself and loving other people. It is a good book. Say that louder. Good book. Good book. Israel knows that's a good book. Amen. He wrote a song. But it grieves me. It really grieves me that we don't see the importance of the things that are so tremendously important to God. Let us learn what's important to God, and the thing that's important to God is that we really genuinely love each other. Not that we just fake it, but that we really genuinely love one another. Even in our differences, even when your quirk gets in the way of my quirk, or my quirk gets in the way of your quirk, we rub each other wrong, or you get out of bed some morning, all your hormones went the wrong way. And you're going to be cranky all day. We have to learn to live beyond our feelings. Got a book for that, too. <laughs> Come on, every one of these books has got 70,000 words in them. That's a lot of word for you to get for 20 bucks to download into your life to hopefully save you when you're in trouble. We can't keep well, you know, Joyce, I know I should forgive, but it's just so hard. Can I tell you something? We are anointed for hard. I said we are anointed for hard. We don't need the power of the Holy Ghost to do easy things and to act like everybody else. We are anointed to do the things that we would not possibly think that we could do, the thing that seems unfair, the thing that seems totally not right. We can do it because God said to do it. Everybody say, I can do it. <laughs> Another reason why we don't forgive is because we don't, we don't think it's fair. You don't think it's fair. Well, if you'd been treated like me, you'd be mad too. I have a reason to be mad. I have many good reasons to be mad about many things. But God told me you have no right to. So you may be sitting here today with a reason. Or the people watching on live streaming around the world, you may have a reason, you may have a good reason, and I can say I understand how you feel, but we have no right to because we don't belong to ourselves. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to another who paid a great price for us and who needs us fully equipped with the power of the Holy Spirit to get out in this dark world and shine a bright light and have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now listen. I know that it's easy to sit and look like, well, this is a great message, but I don't really need this. I well remember going to church one Sunday, no, it was a Tuesday night. The pastor said, I'm going to preach tonight on unforgiveness, and I kind of settled back in my chair and thought, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, yes, you do. And I honestly did not know of anybody that I was mad at. But before I got out of the building that night, God me shoot, t showed me two people that I was angry at, and it had been in me so long I didn't even know it was there. Come on, i got to be talking to somebody. I'm preaching better than you're acting. <laughs> you know how it is when you, you're walking along, you don't think there's anything wrong? You've been, you know, you, your joy's been kind of messed up, and you been a little laggy and draggy, and but, but you, you don't know what it is, you know? I mean, we got places to stick stuff where we can hide from it. And you know how easy it is to justify a wrong spirit? It's so easy to cover something up and, and justify it and make an excuse for it and think it's okay. 
And so when we're walking along and we don't think we're mad at anybody and, and all of a sudden we run into sister, we see sister so-and-so coming around the corner and we're like, <sighs> there's a problem. Are we see sister so-and-so and you know I've noticed for me you know the Bible talks about bitterness and you know actually if we're bitter at someone there actually when you see somebody that's hurt you there actually is a little bit of a bitter taste it's kind of like <laughs> we, we do it it's kind of like that little corner of your mouth will curl up and it's kind of like Come on, that's a symptom. <laughs> you see that person that hurt you, and yes, you've officially forgiven them, and you love them with the love of the Lord. But boy, when you hear somebody say something nice about them, oh man, it grinds in your gut. You're like, yeah, well, you know, there's a few things you don't know. But the Bible says that we're to cover one another in love, to cover one another. When Noah's two sons uncovered his nakedness, and Noah didn't have any business being drunk and being naked in the tent, but his two sons went out and told the other people about it, and they ended up living under a curse, but his one son went in and covered him up. And he ended up living in blessings. Are we going to cover or uncover people? Now I'm going to tell you something, and you may believe it and you may not, but I wouldn't get in the pulpit and lie. I have never one time preached on this message or anything remotely like it, not on offense or unforgiveness or bitterness or anything in this realm, not ever one time in all these years, and I ask people to stand up at the end for prayer if, there was any, if there's anybody in their life that they need to forgive, any kind of offense, any kind of bitterness, which I will do that today, so get ready. <laughs> I have never in my entire ministry ever done that, not on any continent, not in any nation, not in any church, not in any denomination, and ever had less than 70 to 80 percent of the entire congregation get up for prayer. Now that's sad. We've heard the message, got the t-shirt, got the CD, been to the seminar. Well, you know, sometimes <laughs> we're educated way beyond what we're willing to do. If we hear and we don't do, then we're still not reaping the blessing and the benefits, the full blessings and benefits that God gives us. I mean, there's all kinds of mercy and God does all kinds of things for us that we don't deserve, but there's a level that you can step into by honoring that anointing on your life that I personally believe will cause an increase in the release of that anointing. I have to have God's anointing. I don't, I don't do anything fancy. If I don't have that, I'm in big trouble up here because everybody would have already been asleep. And instead you're, and it's early, and you're tired from last night. And all these speakers that have come carry an anointing from God. You don't listen to us because we're eloquent. You listen because there's an anointing there that works in your life. But there's an anointing for every single person. I don't think we even begin to realize how much we mess up what God wants to do in our life through unforgiveness. Now, the first thing that God does is forgive us. The very first thing. That's the very basic bottom line that we have to have for relationship. And not only that, God has already decided when Jesus died on the cross, that any sin that you ever commit the whole rest of your life, it's actually already forgiven. You don't have to talk God into forgiving you. Well, do you know what I've found out? I had to make that same decision in my relationship with my husband and with my children 
and with anybody that I'm going to be close friends with. Now, if you're only around somebody a couple times a year, you can handle it and everything can be cool. You can work around the whatever weirdness you both have. But if you're going to get with somebody a lot, if you're going to work with them, if you're going to be in a family with them, if you're going to be married to them, if you're going to be entangled in relationship, I can tell you right now that there are going to be times when you are going to have to forgive them. You guys are not nearly as excited about this message as I thought you might ought to be. You're like, mm -mm. I wish you were preaching on three keys to success. I am. That's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> So I realized, just like God has already predetermined that He was going to forgive me for any goofy thing I ever did, He has to do that to have a relationship with us. Basically when you decide to stay married to anybody, and you know the honeymoon's one thing, but when you start getting integrated, now that's another. It sounds so good in Genesis, and a man shall leave his father and mother and he shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Amen. <laughs> well, let me tell you that it's the becoming that's painful. That's where it gets touchy. And I would venture to say that there's very few people in this room that have been married for a long time that haven't come to some kind of a place in your relationship where you had to make a decision to go under or go on. And to be honest, too many people today when they get to that place they just decide to give up and go get another one. Well that's foolish, you may think the grass is greener on the other side, but I can promise you you'll have to mow that grass too. <laughs> so just, you know, I mean unless it's just something that absolutely cannot be overcome, somebody's beating you, abusing you, you know, just. And there are things, there are reasons why it won't work out. But let me tell you something, if there's any way in the world it'll work out, make it work out because you're just going to have to do it with the next one anyway. And so, you know, there's things about my husband that are wonderful and amazing and, you know, things that maybe aren't so amazing and there's things about me that are amazing. Amen, Dave, say amen. And <laughs> then there's things about me that aren't so amazing. And I said amen on that. And you know, I, I love Dave so much, you know, I used to be quite a record keeper and I mean I was a great accountant and I knew everything that he'd ever done to me from the day we got married forward. <laughs> We'd get in an argument over something and I'd start bringing up stuff he did 10 years ago and 12 years ago and he'd, he'd look at me like, where do you keep all that stuff? <laughs> Where's it at? But I asked him not too long ago, I said, is there anything about me that that you don't care for, that you'd like to change, or anything I do that bothers you, that you'd like me to, to work on. And bless his heart, he looked at me and he said, no, like you just the way you are. Well, that's wonderful. And you know what? He doesn't, he doesn't like me the way I am because there's nothing wrong with me. He's just decided to believe the best. And to realize that anytime I hurt him, I'm not doing it on purpose. And, you know, I, I realize that with him. So we've both already decided if we're going to carry this through to the end of our life. And I mean, we have a great relationship. But there were years where it was really, really difficult. And I want to tell you, I am so glad that I didn't give up because now I don't have to mow the grass anymore. <laughs> or pull the weeds or do anything else. So if you're going to have a relationship with anybody, you've got to say to yourself today, I know there's going to be days when I'm going to get hurt. That's not a bad confession. That's reality. How many of you have ever gotten hurt in a relationship? How many of you have a perfect relationship where you just never, there's never anything, you know? That, how many found the perfect church, the perfect job, the perfect friend, the perfect neighbor? Yeah, well, perfect hasn't showed up yet, and when it does, it'll be Jesus. 
Amen. See, I've made a decision. I'm not going to live angry. I will not live angry. I will not live bitter. I will not be resentful. And it's very important when somebody hurts you that, that you navigate that in such a way where when you come out of it, your heart is good. Where your heart is not hard. Where you don't taste that, that bitterness in you. After my father abused me for all the years that he did, and you know, that word, I mean, I've kind of decided when I say my father abused me, people, you don't, you don't get it because we hear that word all the time now. I mean, that, that's a word that we hear absolutely all the time, abuse, 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 and so we don't realize the devastation of it. So certainly not to be ugly or to be unkind, I want to tell you what I realized he really did to me. Over and over and over, my father raped me. Actually, I've been able to count the times because I know when he did it on a systematic basis, certain days every week, about 200 times. And I hated him when I got away from him. I had a hard heart, and that hardness came out of me toward other people. Now look at me, I'm going to tell you something that sounds impossible. As God has taught me about the power of forgiveness, and made me more and more willing to do it. I finally was able to totally forgive him. I forgave him a little bit in the beginning, and then maybe a little bit more later on when I learned more about Jesus. And then I finally got to the point where I was able to totally forgive him, and hopefully I'll get time to tell you a little bit more about that. And I don't know how to explain this to you, but I can stand here and tell you, for years I said, if, that, if only that wouldn't have happened to me, if that wouldn't have happened to me. You know what? And I know it's going to sound crazy. I cannot even say anymore that I'm sorry that it happened to me. You know why? Because I know that God took that thing that Satan meant for harm, and He has worked such a good thing in my life. I mean, I'm honestly telling you, not only has He done something good for me, but in doing the amazing thing that He's done in me for letting me navigate that and come out with, with a good heart. Yes. Now I'm able to help other people, multitudes of other people, and it, it, it scares me to think where I might have been. Sitting somewhere bitter, resentful, married six, seven, eight times, having a bunch of messed up kids because I kept messing them up. And as it is, we've got a great family, four grown children, all married, wonderful son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws, ten great grandchildren. We're traveling the globe, preaching the gospel, helping people all over the world. And all it cost me was, a, was, was just a being willing to go beyond how I felt, which was painful, and do what God told me to do. Now, let's go back where we started in Romans 12. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. Verse 19, please. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave the way open for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, capital M, meaning God. I will repay, I will requite, says the Lord. It is useless to try to get anybody back that hurt you, because all we will do is complicate the situation and make ourselves more miserable. Well, it's just not fair for them to go out and be happy while I'm sitting here miserable. Well, misery is a choice, believe it or not. And what sense does it make for you to stay home and be miserable and ruin your life while the person you're mad at is out having a good time and don't even care that you're upset? Even a reasonably smart person wouldn't do that. And we've got the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Come on now. Well, they just make me so mad. <laughs> well, let's learn to receive the grace of God. We can't do this on our own, but to receive the grace of God. 
and let God teach us the process of how to navigate through forgiveness. Just because you decide to forgive somebody, that doesn't mean your feelings are going to change right away. You can't help how you feel, but you can choose what you will do and how you will act. Do you know how hard it is when you're mad at somebody? I mean, even, even if Dave and I have a, a spat, I mean, I want to stay out of the room where he's at. I don't want to go in there. I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to see him. I mean, I've slept on the seam of the mattress to keep from asking Dave for any cover at night. <laughs> Lay there and freeze and think, I'm not going to, I wouldn't touch you. I wouldn't ask you for the cover. Well, <laughs> he's not suffering. He's snoring, having sweet dreams. <laughs> Got 90% of the mattress and all the cover. I'm the one that's miserable. <laughs> what sense does that make? So it's not even reasonably smart to keep all this stuff. We need to just let God take care of it. How many of you believe that God is big enough to deal with your enemies when He wants to, the way He wants to? Come on, does anybody believe that God is? I mean, now do you really believe it? All right then, you might as well enjoy yourself while He's doing it. I said, you might as well enjoy yourself while he's doing it. I mean, I got some messy stuff going on at home. I got one person trying to sue me and somebody else trying to do this and something else. I prayed for them this morning, Lord bless them. Let them be happy, let them have revelation. Let them know your joy, let them know your peace, and I trust you to work this out. I trust you to work this out. Now, people say, well, I've, I've prayed to forgive people and it just never works. Well, I was asking God about that once. Why is it the same people always want prayer for the same thing? I need to forgive. I need to forgive. I need to forgive. I just can't seem to do it. Can't seem to do it. And clearly the Lord spoke in my heart and said they don't do what I tell them to. And so I started looking at what does God tell us to do? First of all, he says, pray for your enemies. Now, enemy may be too strong of a word. You may feel like I don't have any enemies. Really what that's talking about is just the people who hurt you, the people that you've got a little offense in your heart toward, the people that, that where there's a little strife in there, a little bitterness, people you avoid because you, you know, all that stuff. First thing he says to do, pray for your enemies. Now, I was in a church last weekend here in Australia, and I ask on Sunday morning, how many of you actually do that? And four people raise their hand. Four people. Four out of a whole church. In the second service are about 25. I guess we got the holier people out in the second service, but <laughs> even that is still sad. Well, that's the very basic thing that we have to start with. <laughs> It says, pray for them, bless, and do not curse them. And bless means to speak well of, and curse means to speak evil of. So to get over what somebody's done to you, you have to stop talking about it. Come on. You got to stop talking about it. We pray, oh God, they hurt me, please heal me, please heal me. It's like having a gaping wound here. and so. The healing starts and you get a nice scab there. And then you start talking about it and it's like picking the scab off so you can start bleeding all over again. Oh God, heal me, heal me, I don't want to be like this. Pastor, can you pray for me, I don't want to be like this. Start to get a nice little healing, everything's good, then you see the person. Then somebody asks you about it. Don't you love it? <laughs> well, I heard about what so-and-so did to you. Yeah, let me tell you. <laughs> Picking the scab off. Start bleeding again. You know, if you pick it off long enough, you may end up with a scar. That'll be much harder to heal. The quicker we can forgive, actually the easier it is to do. 
The longer we meditate on something, the more we talk about it, the more we think about it, the more we rehearse it in our mind, the deeper those roots go. You know what I've found helps me many times? And there are, there are things that are harder. It's much harder to, to get over it than other things. But when, when I get my feelings hurt or I feel like somebody's unkind to me, the first thing that I try to say now is, God help me believe the best. And you know what the best is? They don't even know they did it. And you know what, 90% of the time that's true. People hurt us and they don't even really know they did it. That's not what they set out to do. They just don't even know. So we have to be willing to let some self go. Then the Bible says to be good to them. Oh my gosh. Get out of here. Be good to them. I'm willing to pray. I'm willing to not talk about them. But you want me to spend my money on them? Let's finish looking at this scripture. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. And you're thinking, yeah. <laughs> well, that's not what it looks like. If you really study that out, you'll find a reference in, in uh, Proverbs that says that those burning coals are the love that we heap upon them. <laughs> Come on. You're not that tired. And I love this. This scripture has saved my life. Do not let yourself be overcome by evil, but overcome and master evil with good. Let me tell you something. The devil's strong, but God's stronger. And when somebody hurts you, the quickest way to get over it is to do something good. Let me tell you something. If you're a pastor here, and you've had a young man in your church, and you've raised him up, and you've poured your life into him, and, and you just he's like your son, and he's told you you were like his father, and now all of a sudden, somewhere down the road, five, six, seven, ten years, he, he decides that he wants to have his own church, which you wouldn't be so against, you know, if he would do it the right way. You don't want to hold people back. You want to see them fulfilled in their life. You might even be willing, if he went about it the right way, to sow, you know, two, three, four couples into his life that wanted to go with him to help him get started, but no, he doesn't do it that way. He starts strife in the church. He get, goes about a mile away from where you're at and starts his church, and then there's all kinds of trouble. You know what my suggestion is? Buy him a sound system. Well, I can see you're all in for that. <laughs> Because he already knows he's a stinker. <laughs> he already knows that down deep inside. And what the enemy working through him wants is a fight. So he can justify the way he feels. Well, you see how he treated me? You hear what he's saying about me? But if you, if you help him, if you help him make the mess he's making, come on now. If you help him, you are totally free totally and completely free, and whoever he took, if he took a hundred of your best people, God will replace them with 500. I'm telling you that you overcome evil with good. One day there was an employee of ours that was eating at a restaurant, and there was another two people sitting in the booth behind them, and she heard them really cutting me to pieces. Well, this happened to be somebody that we did business with, and they made a lot of money through delivering, through a delivery service, delivering things to our office. Well, as people like to do, she came and told me, and, you know, of course, I got all upset. And I laid in bed that night. I mean, I was puffing and blowing. I was like, I, I am not going to put up with this. If they think they're going to make money off of me, they've got another thing coming. I'm firing that guy. I'm going to tell him we're not going to use his service anymore. And, and, and I'm going to let them know that I know about them talking about me in that restaurant, and I don't appreciate that. And I was just getting madder and madder and madder by the minute. <laughs> and I heard the Holy Spirit say about 2 o'clock in the morning, you're not going to do any of that. I mean, you know, having kind of, well, what am I going to do? You're going to do just what you tell other people to do. You're going to pray for them, and you're going to send them a present. <laughs> I'm 
going to send them a present <laughs> and let them think that they got by with that? See, that's the part that gets us. We don't want people to get by with it. And the thing that we have not yet figured out is God is our vindicator, and God will deal with people in His time, in His way, and nobody is getting by with anything that they do to you unjustly. It is not possible. You know why? God is a God of justice. And I love that part of him more than I love any other part of his character. He is a God of justice. And I can always count on the fact, the truth, that when somebody doesn't treat me right, if I can, by the grace and the mercy of God, navigate the thing properly, I'll always get a double blessing for my former trouble. Always, every time. I don't know how, but I'm more blessed in my life because of what happened to me than I would have been if it wouldn't have. <laughs> the Bible says if you only love the people that love you, big deal. If you're only kind to the people that are kind to you, any sinner can do that. But we're anointed for hard. Come on, we're anointed for the things that ordinary people can't do. We're anointed to love people that aren't worth loving, that don't deserve loving. I tell you, I prayed so hard this morning that you won't just hear a sermon. God, I pray that this will get beyond your head and get down in your heart. You may not want to buy the rascal a sound system, but you can still do it. You may not want to pray for his success, but you can still do it. We don't have to feel like obeying God to obey him. Well, laying in bed in the middle of the night, the moment that I decided to send them gifts, I wanted to lay there and laugh out loud. <laughs> I mean, like total <laughs> <laughs> I get it. You overcome the devil when you do something good. We don't get the devil back by being angry. We only get him back by doing good. So in deciding what to send them, my first thought was my book, Me and My Big Mouth. <laughs> I will have to tell you, I, that was hard for me not to send them that book. I'm, I'm serious. Then I wanted to send them gift certificates to the restaurant where they'd been talking about me, hoping that they would know that I knew. So I had to work through a few things. I had to get down to the point where I could send them a, you know, not a little guilty gotcha gift. <laughs> Finally, I bought them gift certificates to go out and eat at some nice places, and I sent them a thank you card and told them how much we appreciated all their years of fine service. Oh! <laughs> My gosh, just had another baby. <laughs> Are you guys out there? All right. All right, got now a minute and 45 seconds to finish this. Isn't it wonderful how marvelous the word is? Okay, listen. I'm limping along with this thing with my dad. He never apologized to me, never admitted that he did anything wrong. My mother knew what he was doing, never helped me. She abandoned me. He abused me. They're getting up in years. They lived a few hundred miles away from us, and I liked it just fine. They lived somewhere where they couldn't really, I didn't have to have them in my life very much, and so we'd maybe go on holiday to be nice, because after all, I'd forgiven him. But I didn't stay long, got away from him as quick as I could get away from him. Threw a little money at him once in a while because they were older, and that was it. Still had that little... <laughs> and so I'm praying one morning. <laughs> it's amazing what God says when you're praying. I'm praying one morning, and clearly I felt the Holy Spirit put in my heart, your parents are getting older now, neither one of them are in good health, they don't have decent doctors where they're at, you need to bring them to your city where you live, and you need to 
buy them a nice little house, put them in it, and take care of them until they die. I said, I rebuke you, Satan. I was 100% convinced that there was no way that God would ask me to do that. I mean, like a rage came up out of me at the very thought. Next time I prayed, there it was again. God, surely you're not going to make me do this. Then I did this one. What have they ever done for me? And I heard the Lord say, you're breathing, aren't you? <laughs> they gave you life. You're here on the planet. Well, long story short, I went to Dave to see if he would tell me no. <laughs> I thought, there is no way that Dave is going to want to take the little money that we finally got saved and go buy my unkind, miserable parents a house. Of course, Dave, wonderful Dave, he looks at me and he says, well, you know, if that's what God's telling you, you better do it. <laughs> okay, fast forward, we bought the house, started out trying to buy a little ugly house, that didn't work. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. Put a bunch of used furniture in it, buy them a half-worn-out car. No, no, no. We had to get a nice car. We had to get new furniture. We had to get a nice house. We had the grass mowed every week. We sent, paid somebody to get their groceries every week. We took them to their doctor's appointments. Oh, they just had a nice life. And nobody ever even said, I'm sorry. <laughs> Nothing. Okay, three years went by. One morning my mother called and she said, your dad's been crying for three weeks. He says he wants to talk to you. So I went over, tears streaming down his face. He's a little old guy, you know, on this walker. He says, I just need to tell you, <laughs> I just need to tell you how sorry I am for what I did to you when you were a little girl. He said, now listen, he said, I knew it was wrong, but I really didn't know how bad it was going to hurt you. You see, he grew up in an incestuous family. Now, let me tell you something. Hurting people hurt people. He knew it was wrong. No excuse for what he did. So he's crying and crying. And I put my arms around him. Dave was there. I said, Daddy, it's okay. I forgive you. I've forgiven you a long time ago. And this is what he said. Remember, remember that we bought the house three years before. He said, I've wanted to say this to you for three years, but I wasn't man enough. I asked him if he wanted to be saved. Do you think I can? Could God forgive me? We worked through that. We prayed the prayer of salvation with him. He cried some more. And then he said, I would really like for you to baptize me. Would you baptize me? <laughs> yes! So Dave and I baptized him, took him to our little inner city church and baptized him. And when he came up out of the baptismal fount on his little walker, they brought him down and he goes across the front of the church and he looks out at the congregation and he says, praise the Lord, <laughs> praise the Lord. Something I never thought I would hear my dad say. Now let me tell you something, he died four years ago, but I know that he's watching this meeting in heaven today and he's totally okay with me telling his story because he doesn't want you to ruin your life with bitterness and resentment against somebody who hurt you maybe not even as bad as he hurt me or maybe worse. And I want to tell you my heart is okay. My heart is not hard. There's no bitterness. There's no resentment. And let me end by saying this. When I bought the house, I thought I was buying a house. But I realized later that I bought a soul. Amen. And I know Jesus paid for our salvation. I don't mean that in the wrong way. But that act of kindness broke the hardness off of his heart. 
and he's saved today because of it. I love you guys. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. I got to pray for you. I got to pray for you. Now, after hearing this message today, if you know that there's anybody in your life that you need to forgive from a long time ago from this morning, and you're ready to make that decision, I want you to stand up and let me pray for you. Come on, all over the place. Oh, this is so good. This is so healthy. My gosh, we have to own it and say, I'm not going to live this way. Do you realize how mad, do you know how mad this makes the devil? I think you guys get the prize. I think there's 90 percent up. It's good, though. It's healthy. Now remember, you make the decision. That doesn't mean you're going to feel any different. But you're going to do what God tells you to do by His mercy and grace, and you're going to see a miracle in your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, they have somebody in their heart. They have somebody on their tongue, somebody that they know that they need to get beyond being mad at them. And I thank you for grace right now, grace, grace, and more grace, the enabling power of the Holy Spirit to help them walk this out. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, love you guys. Thank you.